Wonderful. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Slightly smaller crowd than Theo. I am ever so slightly disappointed. But nonetheless, we'll, nonetheless, we'll have a bit of fun, I'm sure, over the next 45 minutes. So, um, yeah, my name is Kirsty Keane. I am really delighted to be here today speaking at the Autumn Fair. It's a great event um, and one that I am um, experiencing for the very first time. So uh, thanks very much for having me. Um, we've got about 45 minutes together and um, I want to share with you the importance of being visually, uh, visually different within the retail environment and essentially talking about keeping stores vital. Visual thinking specialises in helping brands to deliver retail transformation and we do this in store by defining visual policy, developing the skills and knowledge of retail teams, uh, improving store team engagement and embedding retail best, best practice. And we've been doing that for the last 25 years. We've been doing it for lots and lots of big retail brands over in the UK and uh, globally, all across the world. And we're really proud of that. And you can see a sample up there of some of those brands that we have worked with and I know that were discussed in the previous session. I hope to be able to bring you some examples of innovative shopper experiences and visual merchandising best practice. Uh, all of this is intended to, uh, intended to spark your imagination and help you see things differently when it comes to how you view the role of visual within your own business. So we're going to do it over the next 45 minutes in these three subjects. How to be the, and I will explain what that means in a minute how sensation sells, and what are the visual trends that we see out there in the marketplace at the moment. So let's get started. It is a, a really difficult time for retail at the moment, and we pretty much know a lot of the reasons why that is. Uh, it, we know it's not just the legacy of the glo global economic recession, that actually retail overall is undergoing a period of significant change. And we know, I think, in this room alone, you know, just how big an issue that is. And actually, for me, one of the things that someone said to me once, that actually, the store as a concept is dead. <gasps> Scary notion, I think. We store things. That's what a store is. A place to store things. And it's hardly inspiring when you sum it up like that. So if this is where we store things now, vast distribution warehouses for everything we could ever want. Amazon, but we know that there are many, many more. Everything you are selling as retailers, you can get from the likes of Amazon. So is there any need for stores now? If we can get everything from Amazon, and you can just shop online, right? We agree, disagree? Not necessarily. I think the biggest question here is how do we get shoppers back into our physical stores? I want you for a moment just to think about what you do in your day-to-day -day job. So whether you are here buying for your own brand or whether you are a retailer, whatever you are, just forget that for a moment. Don't overanalyze it. Shoppers do not see retail spaces in that way. Like myself, I'm a retail specialist. I am a shopper, but I'm also a mum. So I tend to think about and look at retail spaces through the eyes of a child. I like to see how children see the world. Think of a traditional shoe shop concept. Lots of shoes are stored and quite often only one foot. Asked if you'd like to try on both, but they don't show you both. The other one is kept out the back. That's okay, I only wanted to buy one shoe, I, I think. It just doesn't make sense. So I want to talk to you about the importance of being the. How do we attract shoppers to buy things that we sell in our stores? How do we do that more? Abercrombie and Fitch in Paris decided that naked men was the answer. You're not buying the t-shirt, you're buying this. And let's face it, uh, ladies, if that's your preference, who wouldn't? Retailers have to give shoppers the real reason to go in and visit their stores above what they sell. A bit like Theo was talking about the department stores, we have to give another reason to get them in the door. 
So, the, being the, what does that actually mean? This concept of the is what trend spotters and futurists are now all talking about. Think of a cup of coffee. None of us just want a cup of coffee in a mall, and I am very much a coffee snob. I like a specific type of coffee. I like it made in a certain way by a certain brand. We want the coffee, the one that everyone is talking about, or at least from our favorite brand. Here's an example up here of the coffee. This is uh, Cafe X in San Francisco. They've launched a robot coffee store, glorified vending machine. Yes, it's got the sense of futuristic about it. But is this really what we actually want? Not for me. Thank you very much. Some of you may disagree, but not for me. I want the coffee made by an artisan who knows the story of that coffee, you know, right from its plantations, the different types of beans, and how to make that all-important perfect cup to make me want to come back time and time again, develop my preferences. Believe it or not, this is Starbucks. This is their new concept store, the Starbucks Reserve Roasteries. They are about being an immersive theatrical shrine to all things coffee. This is to really evoke passion in those coffee lovers. They're intending for six stores to launch worldwide. They've currently got one in Seattle and Shanghai, but they're opening in Milan, New York City, Tokyo, and Chicago very, very soon. These master roasters work tirelessly to achieve the perfect flavor. Ralph's Coffee. This is in Hong Kong in Harbour City. They opened in just February this year. Ralph's Coffee is one of the popular lifestyle additions to the iconic label. They've really made headway in New York City, Chicago, London, and Paris. They'll be adjoining the newly renovated Ralph Lauren store in the Ocean Terminal shortly, but they also include artisan chocolate bars from Brooklyn uh, Gourmet Chocolatiers Fine and Raw. They are taking that next level of defining the. One thing I, dis I do agree on wholly, though, is that mid-market currently all looks the same. Shoppers, along with myself, and as a mum, are quite bored of it. So when you look at brands like Apple, they're doing things slightly different. You don't go in there and just buy a watch. You're buying the watch, the watch for you. They approach VM that reinforces brand authority, and you wouldn't ever consider any other. This is the one I want to own. Nike. This visual display by Nike is in its Kicks Lounge in Hong Kong again. But this also illustrates the point. This is not just a trainer. This is the trainer of the moment. You can make it even more the by layering on personalization. Get it exactly how you want it. Choose the color. Choose the name that goes on it. Choose the size. Choose the fit, etc., etc. You are making it the trainer to own. Dyson. Dyson in New York, and they've got new ones opening in Canada and London, we know opened in two, uh, just last year, have really curated VM in its finest. This is all about promoting the product as the. It's, it's VM in store is very much exhibition-like. What they do is they're able to demonstrate their engineering credentials. That's very much what is at the heart of their brand. What makes a functional product a reason to go and visit and see how that development was, uh, was um, actually achieved. You learn and feel far, part of the process of how that particular model was made. And actually, that's what makes you want to buy a 400 pound hair dryer. You can tell I haven't used it. And a fan and a vacuum cleaner. Shoppers no longer just want a pair of glasses. They want the pair of glasses. And this is Young Store over in Berlin. The lovely thing about this particular brand is they, w they help shoppers to see the actual sh uh, glasses being made while they're actually waiting. They're involved in the process. They're literally committed to that particular product. You see the glass going in. You see the frame being made. They are yours, absolutely yours. That product and brand authority is reinforced not just by telling the, the shoppers but also showing them how the glasses are made. It's, it's really simple but extremely clever and highly immersive. 
The glasses are promoted in an almost gallery-like, exhibition-like way, singular and ultimately exclusive and exclusive to me. Hunter over in Tokyo, in Ginza, um, and they've opened another one over in Canada, and we know they've got their Regent Street store, sell what was effectively a pair of rubber boots, Wellington boots. Those boots are now adorned up and down the country in the masses. They are literally seen on every foot walking down various festivals all over the world, come rain or shine. You want those boots, right? You don't want four pairs of them, you might just want one pair, but you know what's really clever about this particular brand and what they've done recently, and we've had a quite a close partnership with them, that they, you can now walk out head to toe in Hunter. So whatever weather eventuality, whether it's a boot, a bag, an umbrella, a Mac, etc., etc., they will sell the lot and you're buying into that brand. One of my personal favorites, Lip Lab by Bite in Toronto wholly immersive experience. What they do is they actually create cosmetics. And this is about the lipstick, a humble lipstick that a lot of us carry around in our purses or in our bags. This isn't just a humble lipstick, this is the lipstick. You can pick the pigment, so the color, whether you want it to be matte or whether you want it to be gloss. You can try it out and you can actually see it being made. And if you want to, you can personalize the case in which that lipstick goes into. I am involved in the process of the product that I want to buy. The ingredients are presented in this chemistry lab scientific way and it uses those props again to reinforce the formula process, to reinforce their overall brand proposition, be part of it, be part of that product. Joseph Cheney here in Covent Garden places workmanship and heritage at the heart of, of its visual merchandising. This is their statement store. This is how they refer to it. The brand wants to bring to life the fact that it makes what it sells. There are loads and loads of references in that store to the factory and the manufacturing, including tooling, patterns, and the shoe display with beautiful leather backings. The polishing bench at the front of the store offers that all-important theater and movement. It's not just a pair of shoes, it is the pair of shoes. After decades, Dr. Martin has once again made itself the boot to own. It's achieved through its use of retail space and visual merchandising. When Dr. Mart uh, Dr. Martins opened its new Covent Garden store recently, it knew the retail space had to be something pretty special. So it incorporates the vibe of its area. Its simple, functional materials and props reinforce the brand's workroom factory feel. And it also positions its brand in its rightful home. Camden, in the area in itself, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is steeped in authenticity and musical heritage. As a result, the retailer made a conscious effort to uh, be able to home a gig space called the Boot Room. Again, adding to the theater and very much bringing the brand to life. Another one of my favorites, I have many, but this is another one of my favorites. Oxford-based UK heritage cycle accessories brand, Brooks 66, uh, down the bottom of Neil Street in the Seven Dials store in London, principally sell bicycle seats and other small bicycle accessories. I absolutely love the way that it is overtly simple and intentionally simple in the way that it uh, presents its products so that you can actually identify some of the finer details about what it's doing. You can see the stitching, you can see the springs, you can see the studs, etc. You are literally seeing the story of those bicycle seats there right before your eyes. So what does all this mean then in terms of visual merchandising? So the way in which you present your product, products will tell stories about your brand and the products and bring them to life. It promotes product authority and expertise and that's vitally important. And now what I would leave you with on this particular point is to champion the, not just what you sell, A. Nobody wants A of anything anymore. So the next theme I want us to have a little look at is one of the major trends in retail right now. It's about delivering sensory retail experiences. 
The reason why this is so vitally important now is because supermarkets have really changed the way in which we operate and the way in which we work. And we actually blame that on them. Because what they're trying to determine is uh, efficiency. They want us to speed up the sales process, help us to get in and get out as quickly as possible. And yes, from a supermarket perspective, that is quite important. But as shoppers, we are not necessarily always time poor, but we are time precious. And that makes the point that Thea made earlier. We want to spe spend less time on the things that we don't enjoy and more time on the things that we do. And as I Einstein once said, time is relative. We will choose to spend our time in retail spaces that make it worth our while. I could talk about this all day, but it's something that I feel hugely passionate about. You've got to give me a reason for me to come in or come back time and time again. So for many retailers, I would say that you need to focus on slowing that shopping process down, engaging with them, giving them more reasons to spend more time in store and effectively more money. So put your hand up if you like the smell of a new car. Just one person, two people, three people, good. I'm glad there's more. Right, okay, yes, good, right, good, good, good. It's very important. Increasingly, retailers understand the importance of balancing the rational with the emotional when it comes to engaging shoppers. And uh, more retailers are using really clever sensory clues, or cues, should I say, to engage with shoppers in new and really highly unexpected ways. So I have a few really fun examples to share with you. This is actually Malton Brown. So we know Martin Brown as a premium beauty brand, renowned for its luxury bath and body products. The usual method of sampling fragrance, spraying on a piece of card, was not quite enough. It was too conventional, it was too, you know, boring. So they use these porous kind of ceramic tubes that you can see up there, these sort of funnels, which then sp sprayed with the fragrance actually lasted for 48 hours and beyond. And it's a much more sophisticated way of testing that scent. Interestingly, Holland and Barrett have also been doing something rather similar. We know Holland and Barrett as being, you know, the healthy, holistic brand that we go to for our vitamins and various other th food uh, goods. But they've also um, recently um, promoted a selection of specialist teas, and they wanted a way of bringing their tea bar to life, bringing tea to life through their tea bar. It's an engaging and intriguing uh, addition to the store, creating a pause point. Um, in its otherwise relatively formulaic uh, retail environment. The tea bar places these open tea bags in the little glass jars with the bell jars over the top, and effectively that contains that smell, so when you open it, it wafts out, and it's highly engaging. You can very much instantly recognize the, fragra or the scent, fragrance or the scent that you like and you're attracted to. And there's information on there to tell you all about that product too. Really, really simple, but it all aids that decision-making process and just makes it more inviting and more engaging with those customers. One I'm sure we all know in this room, Lush. Highly immersive merchandising. They've been doing it for many, many years, but they are still up there, and actually they are still very much at the helm of all things um, immersive when it comes to that uh, retail experience. They stimulate shoppers visually, as we know, it's a highly colorful product. Um, they have the bubbles that as soon as you walk in or look past the window, they've got the basins where people are playing and making the products. I have two small girls, I've got an older boy who's not interested. My two small girls get so excited, they only literally have to walk past the window and they're starting to shake and quiver and, oh, there's bubbles, glittery bubbles. They want to get in there, they want to play. You can have manicures on site, and there are ice boxes to keep products cool and fresh. Shoppers can physically interact with the product. You are engaging with it. I am starting to think I've touched it, therefore I've got to buy it. But it doesn't just have to be visual. Retailers are really cottoned on to using other ways and other senses to evoke those emotions, specifically motions that are con uh, beg your pardon, specifically emotions that are conducive to selling more products. So Honk Muller, uh, Honk Muller here, uh, you can see they're a lingerie brand. So if I was to ask any of you out here, please do shout, um, what scent do you think they might pump through their store? Speak up, sorry. Say again. Not quite, not quite, sorry. Something. Uh, more basic than that. Sweets. Close. 
chocolate, not quite. Victoria's Secret did that. It's actually chocolate. Some might say it's tenuous, but actually the two go hand in hand together perfectly well. And actually there is proof of this because they increased their lingerie sales by a whopping 20% when they started to pump that into their stores. Pretty staggering, don't you agree? Love it. So, moving on slightly to the more tactile, we've got Albert Hein. It's the first supermarket in the Netherlands with in-store farming. I kid you not. They have a herb garden that shoppers can harvest themselves in a mini greenhouse where the herbs are brought when they've reached the final stages of the growing process. Shoppers can pick the herbs themselves, picking exactly what they want, when they want. Whether you want a little bit to make some peppermint tea, or whether you want loads because you're doing a huge roast dinner. You're not just a shopper here, you are also a gardener. So our final session is all about visual trends. So I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, sharing some of the latest global visual merchandising trends that we have seen in our business around the stores, hopefully providing some inspiration and ideas that you could take, adapt, and apply in your own business. Research figures vary enormously, uh, but some suggest that up to 84% of all marketing is visual. The role of visual in helping to influence shopper purchasing behavior and drive sales performance and deliver the brand experience within the physical retail environment cannot be underestimated. And things are moving so fast and there is so much social pressure that people are terrified that everything they do is the wrong thing. Buy the latest iPhone, no, there's a new one out tomorrow, or the new Samsung is much, much better. It is the job of VM to reassure them and guide them through their purchasing process and those all important decisions. So whilst this next slide that I have up here, the uh, humble avocado, is not strictly about VM, it's a simple and clever way of me sharing with you the example of the key functions of visual merchandising to help shoppers to make those better decisions more easily. The problem is real, isn't it? Finding the perfect avocado. I know when I go in, is it overripe? Is it underripe? You know, you have to do that whole take that bit off and test it and whatever. There are a few things more frustrating, in fact there's loads, but I'm not going to go into that. There are a few things more frustrating than slicing into an avocado only to learn you're a few days early or worse still, a few days late. But thankfully, this colour graded slipper, uh, sticker is here to help. It's placed on the avocado skin and the shopper can use it as a reference for how ripe an avocado is. And we know that you know, avocado's skin changes as it ripens. Fascinating. And it really is all about uh, the key functions of VM. Another brand that's used something similar is Streetology. All they really sell is brightly colored t-shirts in plastic tubes, that's it. And they're arranged e e e according to uh, the color in dispensers above the product that they sell. So you see the product underneath singular, and then the actual product that you can take is in the dispensers above. Each dispenser holds a maximum of 15 t-shirts, and there are 170 dispensers throughout the store. So that actually allows for 2,550 units to be displayed. So it's quite staggering, and probably more than you would typically see in a store that has stacks or you know, hanging product. The really clever thing, though, is when a T-shirt is removed from its dispenser to be sold, it's not restocked that day. That's the interesting point, because what that's actually signaling to another shopper as they walk in is, which one is the most popular color? I'll go for that one. The other advantage of this is the pattern around the store changes constantly. It's a little bit like the M&M &M store. With the 170 dispensers, Colourful patterns form and give an immediate indication, as I said, of those most popular colours. Uh, innovative approaches to VM can maximise small spaces too and provide operational flexibility and keep the store environment fresh and interesting for shoppers. This is a New York luxury chocolate truffle brand and they're really clever because they use the walls as storage. So what you can see is the little green and brown lines, that is actually the truffle boxes there. This becomes an ever-changing pattern as each box is removed. 
They have on-pack stickers identifying the variety, and the brand can monitor which particular truffle is most popular at any given time throughout the, and, you know, and by identifying those empty spaces. It's highly fascinating. Another one that I really like, Koch House in Berlin. They communicate its deliver-to-door meal subscription through its retail space, its physical retail space. So unlike a conventional grocery store, it displays its products by recipe rather than by food group, which is a completely different way in which we operate here. Produce and instructions are collected um, and displayed in tables, just like they would be on your kitchen work surface. Everything you need for the meal is centralized in one place. It has a revolving menu with up to 18 recipes on display at any given time. In Berlin, there's a store that literally just sells belts. But they are the belt. And this pretty much brings us full circle. This product repetition makes a bold statement with eye-catching walls, and any product that is placed repeatedly in an artistic way creates impact and offers the customer choice, a bit like the Brooks 1966 with the seats. This also makes the product seemingly more desirable. So effectively, I'm drawing to a close now, and we're concluding our session. But before I go, I'd like to summarize any of the key takeouts from those three parts that we've looked at. One thing I would say is you need to do more than just be a storeroom for your products. You need to bring your products to life by making the product the brand. You need to give customers something super special to come back for time and time again. Give them an experience. It doesn't matter how small it is. Give them an experience to want to come back. Innovate where you can, but one thing I would say is make sure that you do keep it relevant you can overcompensate, keep it relevant. Ultimately, go and inspire your customers. Thank you very much for listening. That is it for me, thank you. If anyone would like to ask any questions, please do feel free. You can find out a little bit more information from us if you want to. Um, there's our website up there, our um, Twitter and Facebook pages, so please feel free to learn a little bit more about visual thinking. But otherwise, thank you very much for your time.